It started with a story, and a photograph, and memories from my ancestors. A soldier with an unfinished story. It started with a desire to bring closure to my family, and a wish to honor a hero. This is his legacy. Courage, vast loss, yet immeasurable gain. Shark attacks, shipwrecks, survival, forgotten history, and a past revealed. A journey to deliver honor where it is so profoundly due. I first learned about Johnny from my grandmother. Growing up, I would beg for her to tell me stories. At home, in the car, before bed. That's when she'd share the tales from her life. Her childhood, adolescence, her wedding, her family, and her brother Johnny. In stories, Johnny's name would appear like a ghost beckoning to be heard. Johnny was very handsome, tall, tall, dark, dark, personality plus, curly black, curly, curly hair. hair. Always had a big smile on but his face. Always, always. And always Beautiful teeth, clapping his chin. And, and ready to help anybody that asked for help. When John lived at home, uh, he used to pay me a quarter a shirt. <laughs> to iron his shirts. He says he wanted it done good. And I learned to do shirts by doing John's shirts. <laughs> and I got a quarter for each shirt I ironed. <laughs> oh, there were 10 of us. Uh, we had a ball. Mary was Mary the oldest. Mary was the oldest. Elizabeth and her brother Mike, they were twins. And then uh, Tony came along, then I came along, and then um, Jenny Jenny came, and uh, then Franny, then Dominic, then Dominic, the the brother of John, and uh, Johnny, Johnny, and Janet, and Janet. That's it. And there was one story which was told most about Johnny. We got the telegram that Johnny was killed in action. And then later on we found out that he was on in Indianapolis. And uh, that's when they were torpedoed and when I got the telegram. Because I lived at home with my father. And uh, I, w I, you know, we never received a telegram like that. And I was kind of excited because I thought it was something from my sister in St. Louis or my brother from Chicago. And when I opened it, I got, I was really scared. And I called my dad, I says, I says, this is bad news, Pa. It's my understanding that the Indianapolis picked up a special cargo in San Francisco. Very few on board the ship knew what that cargo was. It then went on its final voyage and encountered a Japanese submarine. We didn't know that he, it was the atomic bomb ship that was taking the, the atomic bomb over until we heard that he was killed in action. We really don't even know how, how he died because uh, I read where the men were in the water for five days and the, the horrors that they went through. And it made us very sad to think that we were afraid that our brother it was in the water all those days with the sharks and, and the cold water. And uh, they, it was sad. We took every newspaper. We went on every, we're all over town in Chicago. 
because trying to get why? information about Johnny. The more I heard the stories, the more the mystery emerged. I was drawn to the questions unanswered. I felt compelled to fulfill the honor Johnny deserved. He died for his country at 18 in the largest Navy disaster in history on a mission which ended World War II. He gave up love and family and children of his own so that we could have ours. I wondered why he had never been given a tribute of some kind, a memorial, a funeral, an obituary. At that time, nobody let us know that uh, if you wanted to ha bring a casket home, or but they didn't find his body. So we didn't know at that time that you could have a funeral for someone that's killed in action. I cried, I cried, I cried. We went to fortune tellers, Lizzie and I. With immigrant parents and family who held on to the hope that he'd return, closure never came. Yeah, we believed that even though they said he was killed in action, we, we kept saying, oh, he, he can't be, he can't be. You know, during the war, you, you just feel that they're going to come home. I had hopes of him being alive somewhere. Johnny even had a true love who awaited his return. Laura had, she had candles, and she had his picture, and she liked these candles for him. That was in, right in her, the living room of their house. They had this big picture of Johnny and put these candles, and she'd always light it and prayed that he would come home to her. But as the years passed and memories faded, so did the hope of a proper legacy. Even looking through microfilm at the library, the local paper announced that another brave man from Lorraine had lost his life on the Indianapolis, but no mention of Johnny at all. Decades later, I knew that there could still be a way to honor my great uncle's service and sacrifice. I think it would be a great tribute to have this for my brother, who never had any recognition of being gone. With so much mystery and lack of closure surrounding his death, I set out to uncover any information I could on his final days, his final hours. So I arranged an interview with Johnny's shipmate, the chairman of the USS Indianapolis Survivors Organization. Hello. Hello, Paul Murphy, please. Yes, speaking. Hi, Paul. This is Jacqueline Bradley. I'm coming to interview you on Saturday. Okay, you're coming Saturday. That's right. Yes. I just wanted to call and confirm our appointment and talk to you a little bit. Uh, how are you doing? Good. Good. I just wanted to thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Um, I'm filming a short documentary um, just on, basically on my uncle, who was um, a passenger on the Indianapolis, and I'm trying to get information from um, the survivors, and, and you, are, you are a hero. You know this. I <laughs> know. Oh, the hero died. And with that, my journey began. It is August 18, 2007, and we are on the way to Paul Murphy's house, U.S. Indianapolis Survivor. Well, do you live in Colorado? No, I'm from Ohio. Ohio. Yes. Welcome to Colorado. Oh, boy, I'm going to be pretty, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I asked Paul to tell his story. We were told to go to the island of Tinian and that every day that we saved going across the Pacific, we could shorten the war by that much. We arrived at Tinian in 10 days. That's a speed record that is still leading today. Nobody's ever beat that record. He asked for a escort across the Philippine Sea. The Navy told him it would not be necessary. The waters are safe. Because of the secret nature of the Indianapolis's mission, he was not given an escort. Ships the size of the Indianapolis normally had an escort because those ships did not have their own sonar 
to detect submarines. Japanese submarine slammed two torpedoes into our side, Chief. He was coming back from the island of Tinian to Lady, just delivered the bomb, the Hiroshima bomb. 1,100 men went into the water. The vessel went down in 12 minutes. All I had to do was step off of the ship and go into the water. And I swam as fast as I could. Now, last I saw of the ship, two screws, propellers, were turning in the air as the hull disappeared. I lost my home. Then Paul told me the story of the bravest feat I have ever heard. We had no food, we had no water, so we put all the wounded that were in our group on top of the two rafts. And during the day, they started dying. And also, we started to have sharks in schools come up close to our group. Didn't see the first shark for about half an hour. Tiger, 13 footer, you know? You know that when you're in the water, Chief? You tell by looking from the dorsal to the tail. As the morning came around, we found that the sun was blistering hot. Many of us tore off our shirt tails and put them over our heads so that we wouldn't get blistered and burned any more than possible. The salt water and the sun were detrimental to our skin. It was terrible, but we were very optimistic because on this Tuesday morning, around noon, we were due in to the harbor at Leyte, and surely they will be looking for us because after all, we were a major warship. We were an important ship. Well, we didn't know. But our bomb mission had been so secret, no distress signal had been sent. Fortunately, we did not know that. There was not an atheist in our group. I think everybody knew the Our Father. We prayed for his help. Many of them started hallucinating. This was probably the worst part of the ordeal. Some of the men <clears throat> thought they saw the ship only 10 feet below the surface. And if they dived down, they could get a cold drink of water from the scuttle. But when they came back up, it was only a matter of a few hours, their mouths swelled, their tongues swelled, their throats closed up, and they became very belligerent. Nobody wanted to be near them. As the day went by, more and more of us were starting to hallucinate some of the most physical specimens you ever ran on and ran into decided that they saw islands nearby. We never saw them again. They swam off and they were gone. These were the ones that were most susceptible to shark attack. And how many days and nights were you in the water? Five nights and four days. We saw a plane flying in from the horizon making a circle. And as he was coming in towards us, he spotted our oil slick. The first pilot was a man by the name of Adrian Marks. He told the other pilot that it seems the people that are in small groups, that they were the ones most susceptible to shark attacks. In fact, they saw sharks attacking them. Against all Navy regulations, because they were not supposed to make an open sea landing, he landed his plane in eight to 12 foot swells of water, popped every rivet in it, 
I believe, but he'll never be able to take it off again. And the other pilot directed him by taxiing out to these stragglers to pick those men up that most needed it first. And he picked up 56 men, put them in the aisle like cordwood, tied the rest of them on his wing, and tied them down with parachute shrouds so they wouldn't fall off of the plane. And his crew gave each one of them a half a cup of water. And it was the first time anybody knew the USS Indianapolis had sunk. This is awful hard for to tell. To give you an example, the Bassett, when they first started picking men out of the water, they reached over their gunwale of the landing craft and they grabbed them by their arms. And as they raised them out of the water, the skin came right off. But the interesting thing that always has disturbed me about this is the Bassett picked up 152 men at least. And before they got to Samar, two of those boys died. Before they got medical attention. At our reunion in 1965, some of those crew members on those rescue ships told us exactly what kind of a condition we were in. I don't think any of us really knew how badly we were involved with that rescue. I wondered how long Johnny had endured, if he ever made it off the ship at all. So 1,100 men went in the war, 316 men come out. Anyway, we delivered the bomb. What, what did you feel when you realized that you had delivered the atomic bomb? Well, I think it impacted more after we got home. But the one thing that you can depend on, I think all of us realized that that atomic bomb had to be dropped and it was right and justified because we saved a lot of American lives and we saved a lot of Japanese life by ending the war. In the aftermath, Captain McVeigh was court-martialed and convicted of hazarding his ship by failing to zigzag, even though the Navy had ordered him to only do so at his discretion. The defense even called the commander of the submarine who testified that zigzagging wouldn't have mattered, but Captain McVeigh was convicted nonetheless. Overwhelmed with guilt, he took his own life before the U.S. Congress exonerated him decades later. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So my exploring led me home. I now had far more questions than answers. Paul didn't know Johnny or his fate as I had hoped. Yet he gave me the contacts of every living USS Indianapolis survivor. I yearned to learn the rest of Johnny's story. So I sent out dozens of letters. And letters, emails, and calls came back to me from the brave men. But no one knew Johnny. He had only been on the ship for a few weeks. So I started where I began, with my family. I had so many questions. What was Johnny like? He so, was handsome. Was he? Very handsome. Very, very handsome. And he was built. When he worked at the cemetery, 
he really got a built on. He was a great, great boy. Johnny was a great boy. Everybody loved Johnny. He'd make you laugh, he'd make you mad. And he was a very feisty little guy. Very uh, popular, outgoing. Ah, uh, very outgoing. You couldn't help but love him. John and Don, our brothers, were very close. They were 13 months apart. Where you'd see Johnny, you'd see Dom. Wherever they went, they were together. John and Dom went to live with my brother because my mother passed away and we were all so young. So, um, and he met Laura. And who was Laura? What happened to her? She was a beautician. That's why she could do her hair like she did. And she was spicy like him. Laura was, uh, my sister-in-law, Eva's sister. And when my brother Tony married Eva, that brought the family together. Laura was like Johnny. They were both full of life. And uh, she was very outgoing. She, she was fun to be with. And Johnny, he just loved Laura. They were so much in love. We say, you're too young to get married, John. And he says, no, I'm not. I'm in love with that girl. I was so curious about Johnny's romance with Laura, and their story began in such a charming way. The Fiorino family had seven daughters, and the Rosano boys had a thing for the Fiorino girls. We were a close-knit family, really close. And when I say close, closer than most, because what was about to happen was three brothers and a cousin were about to marry four sisters. I'm the son of one of those brothers and the son of one of those sisters. That's right. Two Rosano brothers married two Fiorino sisters. Even a Rosano cousin married a third sister. And Johnny Rosano would have married a fourth sister, Laura, had fate not been so unkind. When John was 16, he uh, decided to join the Navy because he wanted to be stationed in Chicago to be close to Laura. But he was too young to join on his own, so our father had to sign for him. And finally, he agreed to sign for him because Johnny said he was going to join any branch of the service to be, so that he could be with Laura. I was under the impression that his boat was docked and John was put on that ship. Johnny went into the Navy, and uh, he went with a fella, but then they were separated. So Johnny and him had tore a dollar and a half, their best buddies, until we meet again. And then that fella brought that <coughs> dollar to me. I got it somewhere, I can't find it. I wasn't in Chicago when Laura heard about Johnny but uh, I know she was very, very sad, and she put up this picture of Johnny and put the candles, because then when I did go to Chicago, I was so surprised to see Johnny's picture with these candles. And I says to Laura, I says, Laura, why have you got that? <coughs> she says, I'll never forget Johnny. She says, I loved him with all my heart. And she says, and I feel he's gonna come back to me. He wanted to marry Laura when he got out of the Navy. And Laura said when she heard that Johnny was lost, she passed out and she cried. She was yet another tragedy of war. I could see the sadness in her eyes. Laura did get married, but she was very, very sad. She never got over Johnny. The man she married was a nice man and she got pregnant and uh, she died of childbirth. So I think she wanted to join the love of her life. And then there was Johnny's voice from a letter he wrote to his brother Dom while on the Indianapolis. And how about the time when he met uh, Dominic in, uh, in San Francisco? They had 
Oh, yeah. They had one last big visit. Dear Brother Dom, I sure want to thank you and your buddy for the swell time we had in Francisco and Bay. I will never forget it. Well, it sure was nice to see you again, and just at the right time, too. Well, I sent your picture home, with you and me together, the best one at that. Dom, boy, you sure was right about that place. And boy, the pretty girls dancing and the moon coming through the palm tree. Boy, it sure isn't what people think it is. Well, Dom, I guess you will be leaving pretty soon. And boy, I hope to see you out here. Boy, one thing, it sure was good to see you, and that was good luck. Boy, I bet Papa will be happy when he hears we saw each other and say hello to Bud and Gus for me and tell them thanks again. Love, Brother Johnny. May God bless you always. That letter was sent out one week before the ship sank, and it was the last the world would ever hear from Johnny. For me, days passed, years too, but every time I would put the project down, it would find me again, beckoning me. I realized my journey was not about a past I could not change, but about a legacy I could fulfill. And so I changed my gaze from history to the present. Sometimes the best solution is patience and time. On Veterans Day, I thought of Johnny and while looking up new information on tributes to the ship, I found the noble acts of a woman named Maria. Maria's father was one of the survivors, yet she was dedicated to also honoring those who had perished. I wrote to her, and she immediately responded, inviting my family to have a flag flown above the USS Indianapolis Memorial in Johnny's honor. It was like a breakthrough and it inspired me to finish what I had started. This time, I was being led. Within days, the mayor of Lorraine granted us a beautiful spot to place a monument in Veterans Park. My Aunt Angie had now passed, but John's two remaining sisters and all of the Rosano descendants came together to give Johnny a proper memorial. It was an event 70 years in the making. It's a wonderful tribute, not only to him, but to all the men who served our country, uh, to the men who were part of what has been called the greatest generation. He's one of my heroes. You know, I've lived hard and fast, yet I only have one regret, and that is that I never got the chance to serve my country. Thankfully, there are great men like Johnny that got to do it for me. You saved our country. I dreamt of him once that he was running up the steps. You are a hero. I'm Senator Sharon Brown. John Rosano was an American hero. Thank you to John's family, particularly to Jacqueline, for your efforts to tell John's story and to bring him the recognition he deserves here in his hometown of Lorraine. On behalf of a grateful state, I want to thank John and his family for giving the ultimate sacrifice for our country. It's an honor serving those who serve us. Thank you so much to all of you. His great niece is on a mission to finally give him the honor he deserves. This journey has been paved with a thousand miracles. We're bringing him home, but he's, um, he's finding us too. And we're finding each other through him. My father was a survivor from the USS Indianapolis. They all say the same thing. The heroes are still out there. It is long overdue and has taken 70 years, but a Lorain County veteran is finally getting the honor he deserves. I can imagine that John, my Uncle Johnny would have had a tremendous family life had he survived the attack. Johnny was 15 years old when he accompanied his brother Dominic, 17 years old, to Chicago to live with my parents and me. 
It was great fun for me because I had piggyback rides on demand. The word in-law was never used. I wrote this poem by imagining what Johnny would say if he were here to speak today. Look into each other's eyes and distinctive Fiorino Rizzano faces. I'm there. No need for a tear. Because of you, I'm here. Hundreds of thousands gave their lives then, their bodies often lost in foreign lands or at sea. Among them was a young man of 18, John Rozzano, the son of Italian immigrants, handsome and friendly, cherished by his large family, his heart filled with love and a dream. Therefore I, Chase Rittenauer, Mayor of the City of Lorraine, do hereby proclaim now and forever, April 9th, as Navy Seaman Second Class John Rosano Jr. Day in the City of Lorraine. So I first want to apologize to the Rosano family. Why I'm honored to be here today. This should have happened 70 years ago. Shining starlight in the eyes of you. And you were made of gold. Johnny and uh, Laura taught me how to jitterbug. They used to roll up the rug and dance. And being seven years old, you know, I was all wide-eyed about it. And he said, come on, we're going to teach you, Lou. And I said, okay. <laughs> they memorialized Uncle Johnny by flying a flag over this organization's tribute to the U.S. Indianapolis and its 1,196 crew members. My cousin Mike Rosano went to Indiana and went to the memorial and accepted the flag. What we'd like to do is present that flag to my mom and my Aunt Jenny. I'm here to honor a hero, the worthy, unworthy am I. God bless this family, and God bless all the men, all the men of the USS Indianapolis. Today, here it is, a permanent memorial for Rosano, unveiled and dedicated at Veterans Park. We finally brought Johnny home, and that was so important to our family. For 71 years, he never had a memorial, a, a funeral, anything, and now our family has come together to give him a tribute, and I couldn't be more happy. Sleep well, John Rosano Jr., and you men of Indy's crew, both Navy and the Corps. You served with pride and did your part to end that awful war. Our hero was now found, and front page news. A grand memorial, a monument, and a legacy. Even a letter from the President of the United States. And his half of the torn dollar bill? Well, that surfaced too. Yeah. The other half of it is with uh, Uncle Johnny. Here Johnny wrote, your pal Rosie, until we meet again. 
But on this journey of countless miracles, Johnny was about to give us our greatest one, perhaps a sign, to let us know he was with us all along. Now, a couple weeks ago, there was an article in the Lorraine Journal about John Rosano Jr. and this memorial. And many people in Lorraine read this article, but one person read the article and they said, so that's who John Rosano is. And they contacted my daughter Jacqueline and they said, you know, I've been wondering who John Rosano is for a long time. And Jacqueline said, well, why? And she said, well, I have this letter that was given to me by relatives who found it in going through my mother's papers. And this letter, it appears, was written sometime after July 4th of 1945 and the time that Johnny passed away on the Indianapolis. And actually, the letter was saved because on the back of the letter, her mother had written a recipe. <laughs> and, and someone thought that, hey, I think that we should save this recipe because someday her daughter would like to have her mother's recipe. Well, it turned out, on the other side of the recipe was one of the final letters that John Rosano Jr. wrote. And so what I'd like to do is share with you that letter because it more than anything tells us who John Rosano Jr. was. It begins, Dear Margie, this is Margie Klotz Davis. I want to wish you the best of luck and happiness with your little baby girl you got. I sure was glad when I read Arlene's letter telling me about it. Arlene was the wife of Johnny's friend, George Klotz. Boy, Margie, you got what you wanted. How did Jim feel about it? Jim is her husband. <laughs> Well, tell him I will have my cigar after the war, and he could have one too. One for the baby, and one for the war being over. Am I kidding? Gee, Margie, now I can't wait to get home and see her, but I guess she will be a big girl by the time I get home. Well, hope you will send me a picture of her. I'm feeling fine, and I hope you are the same. Well, Margie, I know this is a short letter, but I gotta go and eat chow. And so bye for now, and write as soon as you can. Take good care of the baby, and don't forget the picture now. Tell me all about the baby, and who does she look like? You or Jim? You or Jim. Well, well, may God bless, may God bless you, you and your family. family. Love, Love Johnny. Johnny. Is Donna Partika here? Donna, would you please stand up? I'd like to introduce to you that little girl. <laughs> the baby was me, and I was born on the 4th of July. She was born on July 4th of 1945, and she's a big girl. <laughs> and John knew when he came home that she would be a big girl, and she is. So we've had it about two years. And we wanted the letter because it had a recipe with my mother's handwriting and it meant so much to us because we lost our mother when we were young children. But John Rosano stuck in my mind because we wanted to find out who he was. So when I opened the paper Easter Sunday morning and saw John Rosano and he died in 1945 and the dates of when he died and my birth and, and the beautiful letter he wrote to my mother we finally had an answer to who this person was. Uh, he was dear friends with my Uncle George, and my Uncle George's wife had written to say my mother had a baby girl. To put me in context with my mother was uh, very heartwarming. How many 18-year-olds would write a beautiful letter inquiring about my mother and her baby girl and her son and her husband? And with the dates and everything, it had to be 
very close to when he lost his life. I think he was just a very special, special person. It's just, it just makes me, at 71 years old, you know, I was a little girl and I was loved and I would say thank you because I never knew my mother really wanted a little girl. I sit and look at that letter knowing that she looked at it and she read it and it made her feel good and it makes me feel so good. So we'll always keep that letter, always. Johnny said when he got home that he was gonna smoke a cigar, one for the end of the war and one for that little baby. And I think when he came home, he probably would have got his brother Dom and said, hey Dom, let's smoke a cigar. So I'm gonna ask that they, uh, not in here, I think the, mayor, the mayor would be a little bit upset with me, but at some point today, um, light up those cigars in honor of Johnny and to carry through with his legacy and what he wanted to do when he came home. Johnny, this is for you. Thank you. As a veteran, I'd say thank you. I'm just really glad that you've been able to bring this person back to life for us today and uh, that we've been able to get to know a really good person. And I always think of Johnny when I think of dancing the jitterbug. <laughs> we finally brought Johnny home. I think it's important to honor your past and your ancestors. All of mine hold a very special place in my heart. But Johnny, he gave his life at 18 for our freedom. His mission ended the Second World War. He may have lived a small amount of years, but not many of any age have left a legacy that great. I find it important for my daughter to know where she comes from and for her to know that she has a hero's blood running through her veins. Johnny deserved to be honored, to be thanked, to be remembered. And what a privilege that I was somehow chosen to carry out that destiny. And as with most stories, it's good to end with a little laughter. All right, Chief, how are you doing? Perfect. You want to sit here a while? I'll run that. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you're more interesting. <laughs> Much more. Well, you know, you're better looking. <laughs> you're good in the shade, though. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully when we get there, he'll be able to uncover a little bit of the mystery. Uh... Hey Jacqueline, it's a treat to be able to do this for you and when I'm done, you will only have 999 favors still coming your way. How many months apart are 13. you? 13 months apart. So talk about Johnny and Dom, my brothers. John and Dom, my brothers, were very... <laughs> <laughs> Our brothers. Our brother was very... Oh, John and Dom, our brothers. Ja Can you say our brothers? After she says John and Dom? Our brothers, yeah. <laughs> so say John and Dom and say our John brothers. John and Dom. Our brothers. Our brothers. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're putting that up. Comedy. Okay. Yeah. All right. This comedy. is a comedy, right? <laughs> Ready? John and Dom. My our brothers. <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> Say, John and Dom are brothers. Oh, John and Dom are brothers. <laughs> All right, we're not doing that. Oh, no. <laughs> Just say, 
we had, we had, we had two brothers, John and Dom. See, this is good for B-roll because it looks like she's crying. <laughs> John and Dom. Oh, wait one second. Oh. <laughs> see, see, my 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 two youngest brothers, John and Dom, are brothers. <laughs> John and Dom, our brothers. I can't talk now. Pause it.